You know, and I think unless we're honest about it, a free society is the right to soar gloriously and it's the right to crash and burn. And when you get to a nanny state that says, you know, we're going to protect you from crashing and burning, they're also going to stop you from soaring. Because you won't learn enough. You won't have enough adversity. You won't collide with reality. Years ago, I read a little Reader's Digest story about a butterfly that was coming out of the cocoon and somebody stopped and helped it get out of the cocoon uh, and so disoriented the butterfly because it didn't have to go through the difficult, painful struggle of getting out that it couldn't figure out what to do next. Sometimes people have to get out of their own cocoon. They have to struggle. They have to learn. And if you try to block that from them, they don't have the growth experience. They don't have the internal knowledge that they need. Now, I want to carry you back and remind you just for a second because we're going to leap into this. And I want you to apply it. Remember the four layers of planning, vision, strategies, projects, and tactics. Because I want you to think about entrepreneurship, undertaking, getting things done at all four levels. And remember that you successfully lead by a process of listen, learn, help, and lead. So first you listen to people, you learn from people, you help people, and then in a rational society, people who know that you'll listen to them, learn from them, and help them want you to lead. And, an, and a good entrepreneur does a lot of listening. They have a burning vision of where they want to go, but they listen a lot about how to get there. Okay? Now I want to come back to where we started, where we were at the end of last week, and take back up Peter Drucker as the effective executive. Now, you'll remember that I said to you last week that I thought this was maybe the most important single book on effective citizenship and effective entrepreneurship in the 21st century that has ever been written. And that I really wish every American citizen read it. And I wish uh, probably starting at uh, freshman year in high school it became sort of a once a year required reading. And the reason is that there is so much in it and when you, when you first read it, it's going to overwhelm you. And so you've got to come back again. And I think if people came back at it once a year for five or ten years, it would truly create an entrepreneurial society. Now, I, I decided that my strategy last week failed because I was trying to not put Chiron up, but if I don't put Chiron up, I can't make the points clearly enough. So then I decided uh, that I would uh, write out some key things for you to think about. So I started with something which a lot of people normally skip. That's the preface, which are Roman numerals 7 and 8. Now, how many of you skip past that? Okay. Those, uh, good. I'm glad you read it. Those of you who read it, I mean, because it is, it is I'm, I'm now going to give you something like uh, something like nine or ten Chiron that come out of that page, out of these two pages. Because if you, and, and when you when you see him, okay, first point he says he, he argues is that uh, you have to manage yourself for effectiveness. Remember this this is in a funny way a book about not about managing others. And although the effective executive sounds like this, I'll go up there and I'll be important and I'll be the executive. What he really is saying to you is managing starts with yourself. So everybody has a target for being an executive. It's you. And everybody, therefore, can do it. And that's his second point. One can always manage oneself. Now, let me just say to you, this goes to the heart of victimology. I mean, let me just stop you for a second. Put, I, I don't know if they technically, John, can put that Chiron back up again. But I really think this is worth really stopping on for a second because this is a radical assertion. Remember, I talked to you about the notion that you are really faced with a question here of American civilization with a discontinuity. And this is a good example. One can always manage oneself. From 1607 to 1965, the dominant culture would have absolutely agreed. They would have said, that's obvious. From 1965 to 1994, we had a discontinuity. And you had a dominant elite culture that said, how can you expect Sam to manage himself? Sam's black, or he's a poor white from West Virginia, or he's a refugee from Vietnam. Sam's had a hard life. He'd like to manage himself, but, I mean, it's hard, you know, and it just isn't fair to expect that of him. Sam's a victim. And for you to set some goofy standard 
that Sam has to actually manage himself is just a sign you're either totally uncaring or you're out of touch with reality. Now, isn't that close? I mean, how many Oprah shows have there been? <laughs> I mean, what, what, can you imagine if Donahue and Oprah said halfway through, if, if, if at the end of the first half, when the victims got done explaining their, their pathologies, the second half of the show was, now tell us again why you didn't manage yourself. <laughs> and the whole second half, half of the show was, tell us why, do you have a telephone? Do you have yellow pages? Can you afford a newspaper? I mean, you have people who can buy beer every weekend, but they don't have any money for a newspaper. And then we're supposed to say, that poor victim. You have people who are paid to do nothing all month. And they sit there a block from a public library. One example I was giving the other day was I was on a radio talk show somewhere, I think in Boston or somewhere. And they called in and talked about a woman who'd been now on welfare for 17 years. And my question was, that meant that she had 17 years times 365 days, take out Christmas and New Year's and whatever, to go to the local library. And, but she'd stayed home to raise her children, which is uh, uh, certainly a legitimate argument, although working mothers go to work and put their children in nurseries to pay the taxes for this person to stay home. But that's not, that's not here nor there. Okay, fine. As soon as the kids went to school, which was about 12 years ago, did she go to the library then? I mean, she had, after all, from 9 a.m. to 4. And it's not to pick on this individual woman, but it's to say, look at the mindset we now accept. I mean, when Drucker says one can always manage oneself, that's a very radical assertion in the welfare state. And if you take the words seriously, going back to George Orwell's uh, great essay, Politics in the English Language, words matter. If one can always manage oneself, the first question to ask of every able-bodied person is, so what are you doing to improve your life? So when a homeless person shows up for the 12th straight day, a good question is, and what are you going to do for, to earn your meals? And the minute you say, well, they're a victim, then either Drucker's right or Drucker's not right. Should the real sentence be, one can always manage oneself unless one is a victim? Or is it one can always manage oneself? I mean, it's, it can't be both. Now, let me carry a step further, though. And this is where Drucker really was a genius in his studying of Sloan and Marshall and, and Theodore Vail. What Drucker came to understand was that, that, that effectiveness is a small number of practices. And that you can practice effectiveness until it becomes a habit. This, this is part of what truly changed my life. And the reason it changed my life is if day-to-day -day being effective is literally learning the habits that work and then practicing the habits that work, then you can begin to say, okay, what, ha what is it I can't do very well? I mean, maybe you're not a good salesman, maybe you're not a good speech maker, maybe you're not a good bookkeeper. Well, then you can begin to break those down into habits. Now, what are the habits? What are the practices? And, and, and you'll know he uses the analogy of practicing Mozart. He says his, his music teacher taught him as a very young person. This is another example, by the way, like Ogilvy, that Drucker, who, who is writing a management book, is using a lesson he learned from his music teacher. Because knowledge matters where you can apply it. It doesn't matter based on credentialing. So he's giving you a management lesson about life based on his piano lessons. Which is why real liberal arts is non-disciplinary. It is using that which makes sense out of the real world and tying it together with the perceived wisdom of 5,000 years of written history. 